Hello everyone and welcome to ALCF AI for Science training series. This is the eighth installment of this training program. And today we are going to be learning about physics inspired AI. And the instructors are uh, Bethany Losh. Uh, she's an assistant computer scientist in the data science group at Argonne Leadership Computing Facility. And she's an expert developing methods and tools to integrate AI with science. And in particular, she works on systems and partial differential equations um, that are part of complex simulations. She has been working in this domain for quite some time and she has um, expertise in applying this knowledge to fluid dynamic simulations of engines and climate simulations. Um, as a mentor, we also have today Sean Rosowski, who's a grad student at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in the physics department. And his background is in numerical relativity applied in the context of gravitational wave astrophysics, and also in the use of machine learning to accelerate and increase the accuracy of complex phenomena like turbulence, and in the use of neural nets for uh, the solution of partial differential equations. Um, so before we jump into the training for today, I just want to give you a few announcements so that you plan ahead. If you go and check the website of the training series, uh, you can see that the program goes all the way to the end of this month, that is February 24th. Well, we're going to have three more sessions in which you are going to get to know three different teams um, that work on the application of AI for a variety of challenges that are gone. One of them will be in material science, the other will be in the modeling of protein-protein uh, interactions and in the modeling of uh, vaccines, and the other one in healthcare. In all these different sessions, you are going to see how these different teams apply some of the knowledge that you have learned over the last several weeks, and you will see how they uh, advance their field by novel applications of AI and supercomputing. So I encourage you to continue participating. They will also talk about internship opportunities and research opportunities in their teams. So make sure that you attend and inquire about these opportunities. Um, the summer is coming up really fast and we have multiple openings that are going to, to do research. So don't hesitate to reach out to any of the mentors here in Slack, et cetera. Another thing that I want to share with you is that uh, last week uh, we have uh, we had an opportunity to test um, the resources that you, you, you have been using in these tutorials for a hackathon. And so we had teams from multiple universities who worked on developing AI solutions for several challenges in molecular dynamics. And the results were very good. We learned about um, how to better optimize uh, the allocation of resources uh, for these hackathons. And I'm telling you this because um, sometime in between April and May, we're going to have another hackathon learning from this experience at a larger scale to which you will be invited. So um, stay tuned. We really want to see how you put in action the skills that you have been learning over the last several weeks. And the prices will be quite juicy. Uh, so please stay tuned. So that's it for announcements. I think we, we are ready to start this training session. Um, Beth or Sean, please uh, take it away. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Let me share my other browser window. Okay, there we go. So uh, the title of this week is Physics Inspired AI, which is a pretty broad title. Um, and we're going to dive into some tutorials on some particular uh, ways to incorporate physics in AI. But first I wanted to give kind of an overview of there being like a lot of other approaches 
so that you don't um, kind of step away and think, oh, these are like the three things you can do. There's, there's like a lot going on. Um, and if you don't, if you're not a physicist, you might say, physics informed AI, that's, that's not me. But you can think a little more broadly um, about this being related to chemistry and biology and applied math. And, um, you'll see in the examples. Okay, so in, in a little bit more of a broad sense, there's a lot of ways to incorporate your domain knowledge, such as the physics you know, into AI. And, and this is a really popular growing area of research, um, kind of overlapping with what people call scientific machine learning. And you might wanna do this for a variety of reasons. Like maybe if you incorporate the physics you know, then your machine learning model becomes more accurate. Maybe it's simpler, like you, um, it doesn't need to have as many layers or something, or maybe you don't need as much training data because um, you've already told it some patterns, you know, and then the neural network doesn't have to like rediscover that. It can also help you have models that are more interpretable and uh, maybe your models are more robust or, or trusted by others because um, you've encoded some things we know to be true. Like maybe you know that energy should be conserved in this um, machine learning task and you encoded that in your AI. And so um, you can at least assume that the AI is not gonna be wrong in that direction. And also um, often we know some physical laws or equations that are very general. And so if you can include them in your AI models, then you are leveraging that generalizability. Your AI models might generalize better to more data. Um, and if you're interested in learning more, I'm excited that this was listed as a grand challenge in the Department of Energy's AI for Science report. Argonne's part of, is under the Department of Energy. So this is um, an Argonne link. And they talk more about how um, this is like an emerging popular field and um, very helpful for applying AI to scientific problems. And here I'm just gonna give a little taste of the variety of ways people are trying to do this. So one is maybe you have some symmetries that you know about or some invariances like um, you know your data, it shouldn't matter how you rotate it or you know in your data, it shouldn't matter if you shift it. And we're gonna talk about that in our first notebook, the rotated MNIST notebook. And then relatedly, um, people are looking at how to apply constraints to their neural networks, such as a, a conservation law. And this could be a soft constraint, like you're kind of encouraging the network to um, follow this constraint. You have like a penalty if you don't follow it, or it could be a hard constraint, like there the model cannot violate this constraint. Um, people look at creating custom loss functions. So this could be how you um, incorporate constraints or um, it could be even more custom to your exact problem. Like, let's say you know um, you know that these numbers should all add up to one or something. Um, you can also think carefully about how to choose your input representation to your model so that the machine learning model knows all of the physical information that you know is relevant to the problem. And here I linked to a paper um, where they're talking about how to represent molecules, which is um, pretty unclear how you should represent a molecule to and put it into a network. And there's a lot of ways that people are doing this. You could also, if you know a differential equation and you want to learn a solution to it, you could constrain the network to learn a solution to that differential equation. And Sean's gonna talk about this with physics informed neural networks or PINs. And if you want to generalize across um, 
something like different initial conditions or different boundary conditions, then you might want to learn an operator network, which Sean will also talk about. And something I've worked on is um, learning governing equations from your data. So something like um, you have some data and you assume there are some physical laws underneath it, but you don't know what they are. Um, maybe you assume there's ODEs or PDEs and you want to learn it from your data, but you still put in some, some assumptions. So you assume like, maybe you assume there'll be polynomial terms or sines and cosines, and that maybe there should only be a few terms to in your equations. Like if there's a hundred terms, then it's not like simple enough to be the real governing equation. So here I linked to my personal favorite method for this, Cindy, which is something I've used in my research. Um, another approach is learning a hybrid model. So let's say you have some differential equations that govern your system, um, but they're not perfect, either because they don't capture all the physics or maybe the data you collected uh, has some noise in it. So you could um, couple that with machine learning and the machine learning model is only learning the difference between what the physical model predicts and the data. And so people call this like a hybrid model or they call it gray box modeling in contrast to black box where you kind of know nothing um, or it's related to closure modeling if you've heard of that or people call this discrepancy modeling. And I linked to one example paper uh, recently on learning a hybrid model, but there's a lot of work in how to, how to do this. And another approach would be to train a machine learning model for just part of a simulation. Now, the, the less um, maybe physics informed approach would be you, maybe you train a machine learning model to replace a whole simulation and maybe you kind of drop all that physics, you know? And maybe a way to incorporate more physics is if you only train a machine learning model for part of the simulation, and then um, you apply the model and the output of that model goes into the rest of the simulation. For example, um, you replace the most computationally expensive part of the simulation with machine learning. So it's you know, something like 10,000 times faster, then feed that back in. Um, and as an example of one, or sorry, a couple ways to do this, you can click on one of our previous tutorials on coupling simulations in machine learning. Um, and this is just to give you a taste of current approaches, um, but if you want to learn more, you could check out this cool tutorial, Machine Learning for Physics and Physics for Machine Learning from December. And um, they go really in depth. And I thought it was interesting. They talk about um, three categories of approaches. One is you're concerned about learning some energy or conserving some energy or you know something energy based. One is geometry, like these things like translation invariance or rotation invariance. And the third is differential equation. Like you know some differential equations, you're finding differential equations. And that third category is what Sean and I have the most experience with. Um, but I don't want to leave you thinking that's the only way to think about um, incorporating physics in your AI. So that's a quick overview before we dive into a few examples. Does anyone have any initial questions? Okay, so um, we did this step one, an overview of approaches. And step two is that we're gonna talk about invariances in CNNs. And this is this rotated MNIST notebook. So as usual, we're going to go um, launch a Jupyter notebook on data GPU. So um, 
we go to the CRL, log into Theta GPU, select that we want a Theta GPU compute node. Um, I think 45 is way more than we need for this notebook. I guess we'll have to do this again for Sean's notebooks. Okay, so we're going into our GitHub repo as usual and we're on the seventh topic and we're starting with the rotated MNIST notebook. And um, here I have this uh, recent Conda um, environment, but if it's not already selected, you might want to select your kind of environment up here. Uh, any questions? I think you guys have some practice with that. Or you can ask in Slack. Okay, so this notebook, um, back um, in the fall when you learned about deep learning, Asad talked about the MNIST data set. And this notebook is extending his um, Notebook on MNIST. And we're going to talk about translational invariance in CNNs, meaning that if you shift an image a little bit, it does not affect the output. And then we're going to talk about how you might make a CNN robust to rotating an image. So, first, um, we're just repeating what Assad had. Um, we say, you know, we're on a single GPU, import TensorFlow. We need these um, proxies so we can get the MNIST data. And Asad had this uh, nice cell for visualizing what the data looks like. So as you'll recall, um, it's a bunch of handwritten digits, zero through nine. And we can remember that this image, these images are essentially black and white, um, represented as a matrix where each entry is zero through one. And so um, you can imagine that if I want to translate this image, shift it, like shift it four pixels over, then we're um, going to shift over these non-zero entries and um, pad over, pad some zeros over here because we have a black background. But that's getting a little ahead of ourselves for now. Um, we have the same model that Asad had from your deep learning session. Um, so if you recall, there was a convolutional layer, a max pooling layer, another convolution, more max pooling, another convolution, then flatten it so you can do a dense fully connected layer. And this trains pretty quickly on the GPU. And in this notebook, um, Assad did five epochs, which gets you to like, um, you know, decent accuracy. Not exactly state of the art, um, but good enough for our tutorial. And then we can test it on the test data. Um, it's actually surprisingly better on the test data than the training data. We've got this nice code to um, check the accuracy on each class. It's fairly even, overall 98% accuracy. Uh, here's an example prediction of the first image. 
correctly predicts it as seven. Um, and then we have some code to look at a bunch of examples. Um, and it just happened that this selection was all correct. And then Assad had some code to pull out some examples of incorrect predictions. Uh, so for example, this is a six and it predicted it as a five. Okay, so that was all a review from a previous session. And the new part this week is to talk about invariances. So sometimes people say that CNNs, convolutional neural networks, are invariant to translations, meaning that you can shift the image over and get the same answer. And really this depends on what exactly you put in the network, but it's roughly true. And um, I found that there's um, different definitions of the terms invariant and equivariant depending on the context. So I'm sticking with the definitions in this deep learning book, um, which by the way, if you haven't looked at this, um, it's a great book that's freely available online and really gets into uh, the details. Now to be more specific about this idea of being invariant to shifting your image, the, um, I'm gonna remind you here, this image that Asad had of an example, um, CNN. Now specifically, the parameter sharing in a convolutional layer makes that layer equivariant to translation which means that if you shift the image by two and apply the convolutional layer, the output is also shifted by two. And so you can kind of see how that makes sense because remember we have these little filters like maybe three by three and you're sliding them along um, and applying, doing these little like, a, I think of them as dot products convolutions um, and that, the output of that convolution goes here. And so if you shifted the, the number seven, say it was an image of the number seven, if we shifted it over, that would shift over what these little filters are finding. In this term equivariant in math would be um, like, let's say we call G, call the shifting function G and call the convolutional layer F. And you're saying, if you shift the image and then do the convolutional layer, it's the same as convolutional layer, then shift. So that's what people say when they mean equivariance, and that's true of a convolutional layer. Then we often have pooling layers, and pooling layers are invariant to small translations. That means if you shift an image, um, let's say by two to the left, and then apply that pooling layer, the output does not change. So um, if we think about pooling layers again, you're looking at like some window, let's say it's max pooling, you look at like this window and you pull out the maximum pixel. Um, so if you shifted a little bit, then that um, function of pulling out the maximum of that window isn't affected because you just slightly shifted over. And um, this idea of invariant if we write it in math like let's say uh, the shifting function is g and the pooling layer is f then doing the shifting first then the pooling is the same as um, pooling directly so when we combine these together we these layers together we get the idea that cnns are invariant to translations, meaning that you can shift the image over a little bit and not change the answer. Um, and we'll, we'll test this out. Okay, so um, here I just have a little function where I pass in two images, apply the model, and then plot them. And this little function says, um, 
I have the original image and then I'm going to shift that image um, using this scipy function. And we tell it how much we want to shift down, how much we want to shift right. And then there's this third dimension um, that we don't care about. That's that channel that's only one because it's grayscale. And this parameter is saying that when we shift over and we have to like fill in the new empty space, we're going to fill it in with black because we know that's our background. Uh, let's see. Oh, just added this. Okay, good. It's going to say this worked before. Okay. So here's an example. The original image was the seven. I shifted um, to the left by five and up by two. And it's still labeled it as a seven. And then um, here we're moving to the next image and I'm just going to do a tiny shift. Um, we went up by one pixel and um, to the left by one and it's still correct. But this example um, can't handle as big of a shift. Bethany? Yes. Now, there's a question in chat about um, the invariance of shifting for pooling layers. Um, yes. Where you said it was invariant to like a change of two, uh, but that's only true if there's a large stride. But if the stride was two, it might have different output. Yeah, I think um, that's. Yeah, I, I, I was just giving two as an example. Um, I think that's where we get in this idea that it's invariant to small translations. Um, does that make sense? So I think it would depend on um, the exact network in your there. It has to be less than the, the stride, right? Yeah, because otherwise, um, you've shifted and you're out of your window. Um, you've shifted the image, you're no longer in your um, window that the pooling is going over. Um, and so now it's not gonna be invariant anymore. So like um, if we shift too far and you do your little max pooling, you've lost that pixel. So, so here, this, this first image, I was able to do this like um, shift by five to the left and up by two, and it was fine. But for the second example, the same shift, um, we got a different answer. And um, you guys could mess around and try other um, pictures by changing this index into the data, and you can try other shifts. And um, here's an example paper that um, tries to address it. They have this humorous title of making convolutional networks shift invariance again. So we can um, you know, roughly say, people roughly say CNNs are translation invariant, but it's not like exactly true. Some level of that, okay. Now, what about rotational invariance? So depending on your problem, um, you might say, if I rotate, the answer of the CNN should not change. Um, like maybe your input to the network is a molecule and you know that if you, and it's like depicted graphically and you know, as a human, if you rotate it, it's still the same molecule. Okay, so this is um, a similar function, but instead of shifting, I use this rotate um, function and I can give the angle I'm gonna rotate by. Um, so I rotate by 90 degrees 
And as you might expect, the CNN doesn't handle that. It guesses that the two is a four because there's not really any reason in the design of a CNN to um, understand rotations. And um, the MNIST data set probably doesn't have any examples in it where people wrote their numbers upside down or sideways. And um, there are a lot of papers, recent papers, trying to make versions of CNNs that are rotationally equivariant or invariant. And I got a little carried away here. I gave you guys examples from every year. I got as per except. Oh, this is pretty cool. Um, and this is they are changing the definition of the network in order to handle such things. And you can tell from the titles, in some cases, they're trying to handle something more general than rotation, um, some kind of other symmetries or groups. Um, so if this intrigues you, you can you can look into that and you can see most of these papers come with code. But for the purposes of this tutorial, we're gonna take the simpler approach, which is we're gonna augment the training data with rotated examples. So in this function, um, I take in the data and I, I um, first I just make a, a big array that's twice as big um, by duplicating the data. Same with the labels. And for simplicity, I say I'm only gonna rotate 90, 180, or 270 degrees. And I go through all the images and um, in the second half of the data set. So the first half of the data set is the original data and the second half is um, repeat that data, but apply a random rotation to each image. So I'm filling in the second half of um, augmented images. Um, grab the image and apply a rotation. I'm randomly picking from these three options. And again, we um, this parameter says, well, I guess it shouldn't matter since I picked um, multiples of 90, but fill in the background with black. And then I, um, I wanted to shuffle the data so it's not in order. So I picked um, a shuffling of the indices and apply the same shuffling to the images and labels. Um, so this all means that we have new training and test data. It's twice, they're twice as big. Um, and uh, they have the original data set plus each example repeated, but with a rotation. And um, this might be kind of a tricky problem, harder than the original on this data set. If you think of like, I don't know about you guys, but I like to play various card games. So then you get into the situation where you have cards on the table and you have to read them sideways or upside down. And a lot of cards, they'll put um, like a number or a line under the six. So you can distinguish a six and a nine from across the table. So um, maybe a weird machine learning task. But rotated MNIST is a benchmark problem in a lot of these papers I cited. And as a sanity check, we can um, plot a sampling of this new augmented data and see, um, okay, we've, we've got some of the original images plus some random rotations. Then we're going to Sorry, was there a question, Kyle? Yeah, actually, I had a question. Um, yeah. So the rotated benchmark, um, did they unify the six and nine classes? Um, when reporting I don't, accuracy? I don't think so, but um, I didn't dive in. I was hoping that there was just like a standard rotated MNIST data set that I could download. And I guess that would have answered that question of labels, but it seemed that people were just doing what I'm doing and applying rotations. So as far as I know, they're not like unifying those classes. So maybe um, we hope that, I mean, people typically don't draw their sixes and nines exactly the same. So I guess we're hoping the model picks up on that. So we're going to um, use the exact same CNN architecture as before. 
convolution, pooling, convolution, pooling, convolution, fully connected. Um, but train it on this uh, augment data set. It'll take a little longer because we made the data twice as big, but it's still pretty fast on the GPU. And I'm also not sure on, I didn't like dive in on this um, benchmark if they typically do um, the full range of angles. Like I only did multiples of 90, but you could imagine depending on your application, like really you care about five degree rotation, 10 degree rotation and so forth. Okay, the accuracy is um, lower than before, but not by a lot. And we can see the per class accuracy. And it's not as uniform as that original model on the original data. And um, as I suspected, the sixes and nines are on the lower side. The zeros and ones, I guess, are the easiest. I think that makes sense. Like the one is just a line. I guess also when you do the 180, um, there's some, one is symmetric, so like flipping it upside down doesn't change things. Okay, so we can again plot some examples. Um, <laughs> well, this one's wrong, but not because of a rotation. Um, and this one is a six that labeled it as a nine. I guess it also happens to not be a rotation. Um, and then we can use Assad's um, function to plot incorrect predictions. So now we're um, getting to dive more into the weird things that show up in this data. Like, I can understand why. Um, <laughs> you combine people's bad handwriting and rotate it, that gets pretty hard. Okay, that is everything I have about these invariances. Do people have any other questions before we hand it off to Sean? There's a question on Slack for you. Would it be possible to train a more general two-stage model where the first stage selects standard orientation for the image and the second stage matches the image desired classification? Mm. Or would it be more accurate or efficient to simply rotate randomly and train on a larger data set? I think the two-stage model might be better um, in a problem with just augmenting your data is that your model might not really learn that these things are the same. It might, you might hope it's learning that um, there's a consistency in the four different ways that the digit three shows up. Um, but it might not learn, it might just be learning like 40 patterns instead of 10 patterns. Um, so I think that's a great question that, you know, maybe you could have a two stage model, one kind of like reorients it and then you continue. And um, I can put in Slack, there's a cool blog post about this first paper. Um, where they used cact cactuses as the examples. And you can kind of get an idea of where they're going, but um, from the pictures, but it's pretty mathy. So I was like, that would be rough to cover quickly in a tutorial. Um, you can get some idea of how people are like embedding these in the network. Um, and, oh, I, th I think this is a great reminder that uh, neural networks struggle to learn concepts. So as a human, we can learn 
that this concept of a, of a three and understand that if you rotate, it's still a three. Um, and neural networks are learning these patterns um, and they have a hard time generalizing to things that we would understand are the same. Yes, Robert, I see you have your hand up. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Is there any difference if you say vote uh, trained four separate neural networks on each on each of the rotational angles and then had them kind of fight it out at some higher level? Mm. I think uh, so. Maybe you'd have um, like this one knows the upper right and this one learns the upside down and so forth, and then decide which model was the most confident or something. That could be another approach. I think I think that could that could be good. It could um, be a much bigger model though. Um, but I could imagine that it could be worth it in some cases. <laughs> it's nice that in this case we use the same size model and it handled um, all, all these extra cases. Although um, it didn't quite reach the same accuracy. Anything else? So hopefully this is a uh, food for thought, especially if you're doing research and um, maybe some of these ideas would be helpful to think about how you can incorporate symmetries or invariances that you know are true in your data. And now I will, um, hand it off to Sean. Thank you, Bethany. So now I would, um, I'm going to talk to you guys about uh, physics informed uh, uh, deep learning. Um, let me just share my screen. Um, there we are. Um, so before, um, before I be, begin, if you guys are following along, um, make sure you install this custom Conda environment. Um, I have it indicated in the, in the readme. Could you uh, zoom in like two levels? Uh, two, all right. Good. One more maybe. Can you, is this good? I think so. Thanks. All right. All right, thanks for letting me know. All right, so anyway, so um, now that that's out of the way, um, yeah, so I would like to talk about um, physics inspired um, AI. So um, just an introduction. So this will cover some of the stuff that Bethany did in her overview. But um, basically, deep learning has expanded incredibly in recent years. This is due in large part to the availability of uh, big data sets, improvements in hardware such as GPUs and TPUs, as well as the open sourcing of deep learning libraries and codes um, like PyTorch and TensorFlow. However, data is not always available in all cases. It can be expensive and time consuming to produce. However, in these cases, we might be able to um, have a good physical understanding of our system. These include scientific experiments and uh, design of uh, hardware. So one solution is to incorporate our known physics of the problem in order to train these neural networks with much less data. So how does physics help? So neural networks uh, retain the biases of their training data. An example can be uh, gender bias in natural language processing, processing, as well as racial and age biases in um, in image recognition. Some of these biases can be removed through um, just playing around the data in data augmentation, as we saw in Bethany's example, where we um, looked at um, added in rotations just by augmenting the images and just increasing the data quantity. Moreover, physics um, knowledge can be used in different ways to remove biases from systems with well understood physics. Um, we can look at, for example, symmetries, rotational symmetries, um, reflections, whatnot, depending on your system, conservation laws, 
and uh, governing dynamics, which take the form of partial differential equations or PDEs. Now, how do we encode physics into our neural networks? Um, there are several ways, but the simplest is to add known physical laws into our loss function. This introduces a soft constraints, um, which will get better and better as we uh, train. And you can see this example of um, Burr's equation here, where we use network to predict some quantity, and then um, we add we um, add in these, um, this equation, uh, Burr's equation, as into our loss function. Now we notice we get derivatives. So how do we encode these derivatives? Well. The neural networks have all this great auto differentiation software. So let's just uh, use it. It's very fast and accurate. So we, we get to calculate the derivatives, and then um, we can weight the data and physical laws to improve the training. So this is um, just a note that you might have to play around with these weights. Um, one common thing is that uh, if you weight very heavily on the PDE, um, just note that the a solution that will solve most PEs is uniformly zero. So you want to get, make sure it um, knows some bit of data before just giving it random PDEs. Moreover, you need to be careful with um, your activation functions. Um, you, for equations where you've got second derivatives, you, can't, you really cannot use a ReLU because no matter what, the second derivative of the ReLU will be zero regardless of its weights. So you can use tan H, um, Gale activation function also works very well. Moreover, you gotta be very careful about normalizing your equations, particularly if you've got different systems of equations, you need to make sure that um, that, that are different scales. Um, they make sure that they contribute the same to the loss function. Otherwise you will just really heavily favor one equation while it's totally ignoring the other. So now let's talk about actually ways of how we express types of neural networks that these are useful for. So you can start with traditional uh, physically informed learning, physically informed neural networks, otherwise known as PINs. PINs are very well-known type of uh, physically informed deep learning models. What you do is you input your coordinates, which are space and or time, as well as some auxiliary variables. Um, it can um, in, be like, for example, um, Hard, if you're optimizing over hardware geometric configurations, you can use the geometries auxiliary variables. Yeah, so you take in these input variables and you output um, the PDE solution at all of, at, um, at the points of your inputs. Although you may want to output other variables, this will be useful for, for example, in, inverse problems, which we'll discuss later. We then can train these networks by um, constraining the encoded physics equations. Um, and then we randomly sample the data. And moreover, we, we may also add in known data points where we know solutions of particular value to further uh, constrain the network. We should note that, uh, however, a limitation of these pins is that they are trained for a signal case. What that means is that they work for a single set of initial and boundary conditions as well as one set of partial differential equations, meaning we cannot modify source terms. All right, so um, we discussed what pins are. So let's discuss what they're useful for. So there are two main classes of problems that, the, uh, that are of interest. The first are forward problems, then there's the inverse problem. Um, forward problems is when I use, a, use the PDE to solve um, things within a specified domain. Um, using a tutorial, so we'll look at various ways in which we can use pins to solve uh, forward problems. Then we got the inverse problem. So these are very um, interesting and very uh, unique to machine learning in that um, if we're given data, data that obeys a known or partially known PDE, we are able to use pins to compute quantities of interest, such as flow fields from sensors at uh, at very few locations or computing unknown PDE coefficients in which we see the example to the right. So this is the KDV equation, which um, is known for, which has um, interesting soliton solutions. So start with this, um, so use the, this pin given some training data, um, it's able to compute these PDE coefficients. 
And even when there's noise, it does a reasonably good job. But in the tutorial, we'll look at using finding coefficients for what's known as a Lorenz system. But um, enough on that. So for now, I just want to show you some applications of pins for various problems. So for uh, forward problems, I mentioned earlier, um, about hardware optimization um, over these auxiliary variables. So one thing that was done is that um, FP, you, you know to optimize FPG design of the heat sink um, by using, by including these, um, the heat sink geometry as auxiliary variables. So you train this once as opposed to making um, thousands of thousands of punk simulations of um, this, this heat sink and um, basically able to compute all possible geometries uh, very quickly. Another is uh, simulations or very complex uh, geometric domains. Um, blood aneurysm, uh, vein aneurysm blood flow is, is a really great example. So what we know, what the data that we know from these is the flow at the inlet and flow at the outlet. Um, that's all we know, as well as the shape of the aneurysm. Uh, um, so we, what we can do is we can use um, pins from this data to simulate what's going on. Um, and moreover, um, you train for one case, and then you can use transferring to significantly reduce training time. Um, the reason why you want to use these pins as opposed to um, a computational fluid dynamics or CFD solver um, is the, the CFD solvers are very expensive for these very complex geometries. Um, and these pins are able to perform reasonably well in terms of reproducing their velocity and pressure fields um, compared to the CFD solvers. And this uh, internal will allow surgeons to figure out the best way to operate on these um, brain aneurysms. Um, for the inverse problems, um, one particularly notable example is reconstructing uh, fields from uh, sensor data in ill posed problems. So what one thing that they, was done was that they took temperature sensors around a coffee cup. And from that, they were able to use pins to help reconstruct uh, velocity and pressure measurements from this very ill posed data. Moreover, it could be, um, in a more general sense, uh, pins, these inverse problems are great for analyzing scientific experiments. We have some we, we well understood models of the system, a control environment, and we can help fit coefficients to, the, to our equations. Now, I just want to give an overview of some PIN software, of, uh, where the first is DeepXDE, which is the one that we'll be looking at in most of these tutorials. There's also NVIDIA's Modulus and, or SimNet. This is more of a production scale one. Uh, it changed its name from SimNet to Modulus, so I have both. There's a couple of others, uh, uh, Neural PDE, if you prefer Julia, and this is a bunch of examples using this library, uh, as well as others. I include the slides in the GitHub, so feel free to check any of these out. Uh, again, I'd like to note these uh, limitations of pins. So yes, yeah, so they are only um, good for a single set of initial and boundary conditions and or source terms. So you need to retrain for each new configuration. So pure pins make surrogate models. Later, um, we'll look at using opera nets for solving uh, PDEs with variable input fields. But for now, let us look at these uh, exercises. Um, so we've, we're gonna look at Burger's equation, um, Poisson in L-shaped domain, um, a very complicated geometry, and then this Lorentz inverse system. So I will, um, yeah, so if you haven't done so already, make sure you install the, the condo environment if you are following along. All right, so let us um, begin. So, waiting up for a node. Is there any questions while we're just waiting everything to get started?
Right, there we are. All right, so now the server is starting up. Um, let me know if, uh, if there's any issues with uh, Zoom and whatnot, um, uh, being able to see everything. Uh, here we are. All right, so let's start with uh, the Burgers equation. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is this uh, matplotlib notebook will allow for interactive uh, plotting. And now um, also I'm just going to wait for um, for the DBXC package to load. So a bit about this package. So this is a um, so um, this is a package able to work pins in all sorts of different geometries. But um, so currently what it does is it, it's, it's got a bunch of different backends. Uh, we're using the TensorFlow um, V1 backend, which is the original one. Um, so, um, um, yes, yeah, so, so TensorFlow takes a little while to load up, so that's what we're waiting for. And in the meantime, I'll talk about the equation we're looking for. So, um, oh, there we go. Um, so uh, this equation is Burr's equation. Um, uh, Ut plus Uux equals some viscosity um, times Uxx. So this is our PD. Then we have our domain. All right, everything works now. Um, so we have a domain, which is x from negative one to one, time from zero to 0 0.99. And then the initial condition is a negative sign of pi x. And then um, the boundary conditions are homogeneous Dirichlet, um, or Dirichlet, um, which means um, at the end point, u is zero. So we also have some test data um, that we can uh, generate this, um, that, that we're just going to load up that's in one of the files. And next step is to define this PDE. So we've got to actually define each of these lines here um, to set it up. So the PDE, um, the deep, deep XDE package comes with these nice functions um, for computing derivatives, Jacobian and Hessian. Um, for first derivative, so the way it assumes the data is that X is the inputs, Y is the output. We have a single output here and um, two inputs. So the, in, the um, if you've got multiple inputs, um, each input is a different column. Um, so um, here, X is gonna be the zero index column and Y will be the one index column. For the, in the Jacobian function, um, I refers to um, the index of the output, J refers to the index of, um, of um, the input. So here is uh, differentiating y with respect to um, x, and then t here is the one one indexed um, a column. So we have um, dy dt is equal to to this. The Hessian uh, both i and j refer to um, the input. I believe there's another function to help specify if if y has different multiple columns. But yeah, so here, zero, zero is just um, dy dxx. And here, when for this return function, you put everything on a single side and, you'll, and the code will assume that um, this, the, the out, if everything goes well, this PDE should return zero. All right, so there we've gotten the PDE. Next step is the geometry. Uh, this is a very simple geometry, it's 1D. So we just have um, an interval from negative one to one for, in the, for X and then time. Um, you should pretty much can use um, the time do domain function for just about anything. And you start from the start point and the end point. Very simple. And for time dependent problems, we merge geometry and time together in this geometry X time function. 
Um, I recommend checking out the DeepXD GitHub for um, more details on this. All right. Anyway, let us look at um, defining different initial, con initial condition and boundary conditions. We'll start with the boundary condition. So um, the DeepXD has a bunch of different boundary conditions you can choose from. Uh, Jiraplay, Robin, Neumann, condition, et cetera. Um, so, um, so the first thing that you put here is the geometry. So um, here it's geom time. Then we put the value at the, at the desired boundary. Finally, um, um, this logic function here, this is to check to see if the point's on the specified boundary. It gets a bit more complicated if you've got multiple um, boundaries, but the first input's supposed to be your coordinates. It's empty here just because um, all boundary points have the same um, <laughs> boundary condition. Uh, we'll see a more complicated example of this later. Finally, um, we've got the initial condition, this line here, where we have, um, where we again, just same format as the boundary condition. But, um, but, um, but instead we, instead of zero, we have an actual value. And then we have, um, then we have this function here that checks if there's multiple um, initial conditions, make sure that you pick the right one because we like piecewise um, <clears throat> data. All right, very good. Then we combine everything together in something called a data object. This data object, geometry, PDE, then your initial and boundary conditions, and then the points you want to train on. Um, here is this is what I decided. So domain points, points on the boundary, and points on the initial. So very simple there. There's a couple other options you can do with that, but that's the case right now. Then we define the architecture. So in um, um, d.maps, um, you can see a very simple way of defining these uh, neural networks where we just have a list of number of layers. So the first one, make sure it matches the number of inputs. The last one matches the number of outputs. Then your activation function, and then your initializer. Remember, we cannot use the relo activation function just be because um, the second derivatives of that are zero. Okay, very good. And then you have this model class, which is just combining the data, the data and the network. All right, very good. So now I'm just going to define uh, the path where we want to save stuff and load stuff. So um, I'm not going to, um, yeah, so, um, so I have a, so if you do want to load a model, make sure you compile it first, otherwise it will give you an error. Um, and now we train the model. So uh, we train the model twice. Um, first, we're going to use what's known as the atom optimizer, which is very common uh, for 20,000 epochs. And then it's going to use um, a, a second order optimizer um, after it's already been um, nice and uh, conditioned called LBFGSB. Um, and um, that will fine tune the model. And um, yeah, so we it train this will train pretty fast. Um, so let me know if um, they've got any questions while we train the model. So yeah, it's all it's um, nearly done the first round of the training. And then it will fine tune the second round. Yes, yeah, so it did. Uh, it didn't do that many iterations for the second round. Then you can save your model, and then uh, plot the performance. So yeah, you can see um, we didn't have any test data in during the actual training phase or validation data. So it's just the training data, and this is plotting all the points. You can't really see it well. So we're going to look at what's going on more later down here. So first we're going to check to see, so we're going to load the test data and make predictions and calculate the error. You see the error is around 0.2. Uh, 
All right. And then uh, it's going to get the data in a nice form for plotting. So we can actually see what's going on. All right, so let me explain these plots. So the first plot is the, um, is the exact data. The second is the prediction. And then the third is the absolute error. Um, just, um, just subtracting the two. Um, the, the, y, the x axis is the position x, the y axis is time. So the way I read these is you look down at you look down um, so space is horizontally and you go up to see how it evolves in time. So we know that um, that initially everything looks good, but then midway through you've got this weird vertical thing in the middle. So what's that about? So I'm gonna we can take advantage of the some we can plot this in real time to see how it evolves. So there we go. So we see what's going on. So what happened, the Burgers equation is a great way to study shocks. Um, it's not a true shock because we have um, some viscosity, but still a very, it's still very steep. We notice that, um, that um, there's a difference between the location of the net of the pin prediction for the shock location, as well as the, um, as well as the data's um, location of the shock. So when you have a phase error like this, it's, it gets, um, it's very, it's make sure data disagree with the predictions really poorly. So one way we can solve this is to add additional points at near the shock. So um, this is a refinement method. So um, it takes a little while, so I'm actually gonna still load my previous checkpoint for this. But essentially what this does here is you make a is make a your prediction and then you add additional points in a training. Um, and um, and yes, yeah, so you just keep on adding points until you get your error down to what you want. So um, I'm not going to train it because I've just loaded it, but um, oops, ah, sorry about that. So um, that. Um, wasn't supposed to run that cell, but essentially it just improved, shows how it improved with time. And now if we just show the error, we notice that compared to 0.2, it's nearly 20 times better. Um, so, and now if we plot the um, predictions, uh, we notice that um, we have some error here, but it's um, much smaller, um, 0.06 compared to about, uh, compared to a maximum of 1.75. So yeah, just make sure you, um, networks, make sure you, you uh, if you've got a feature like this, make sure you have points near the feature. And if we look at the um, plot this in real time, then, um, Yeah, then you see it really does line up much better than the previous test. All right, so that's it for Burry's equation. Is there any questions? If not, I'll move to the next example. Hey, Sean, um, we're having trouble with the condo environments um, in loading the one that you shared. Um, Is it basically um, the, the condo module plus deep XDE, or is there anything? more that you needed to add? There is more for the last tutorial, but yeah, so I'd recommend just installing um, deep XDE. You can use PIP or Conda to install. Um, that should do most of it. Okay, that might be better than um, also, yeah, also than troubleshooting the one that's shared. Yeah, so also if you, I, read, um, I was playing around this myself, I, I do, I install, registered the terminal from the um, the kernel from the, my um, terminal, not from the Jupyter notebook. I actually mm. noticed that I had trouble getting that from the um, from the Jupyter notebook. I just copied the instructions in I think it was the second session. So one thing that I did so I, I recommend following the terminal instructions 
registering the notebook and you should be able to, to pick your environment here. Okay, thanks. All right, so um, if there's, there's, there's no other questions, then um, I will move on to the second tutorial. So yeah, so first, so we, um, so again, we import the libraries and uh, make our plotting. And we'll just wait for TensorFlow, uh, the TensorFlow backend to load in. And so here we're gonna solve the Poisson equation, um, grad squared u equals to minus one um, with Euclid boundary conditions in an L-shaped domain. So once that loads in, all right. So now we define the PDE, and we use these Hessian uh, functions to take the second derivatives. So again, with Hessian, um, i and j each refers to the input. So um, x at, um, um, differentiate by x twice and then differentiate by y twice. And we should get, uh, then we just have the PDE, everything on the same side should return zero if everything works right. We define a geometry. So deep XD is a bunch of different geometries. The one we're gonna use is polygon where we, um, have where we use the have various different vertices and we just define um, have the vertices and that defines the geometry. And then we just plot the geometry and verify yes, it is an L shape. Then um, we define the boundary term. So again, just like before, do you have the boundary conditions? And because we don't have initial condition because it is uh, just um, no time, we can just um, geometry, um, PDE, boundary, and then we define the number of points. And uh, then we define the net neural network, same as before. Two inputs, one output, and then four layers of 50 neurons in the middle. And combine them together to form our model class. And now we define our uh, paths, just for saving and loading the model. Again, this model takes a little while to train, so I'm just going to restore some of my old weights and just show you what the results look like. But here is what it looks like for training. So we noticed here, the this is one thing with that second order optimizer can help, where we have um, this is decently well and then it does, and then once you've gotten it good, it really improves. So now let's load the, this test data that we have saved and then predict. And some visualization stuff. Um, make sure there's no na um, NANDs that were plotted, just stuff that's not in the domain. And then here is what it looks like. So we see the exact solution, the predicted solution, and the absolute error. Um, we notice that there's um, the predicted solution a little bit greater than the exact solution. And moreover, we notice that there's a bit of, quite a bit of error near this corner here. Um, but overall, it still looks pretty good. And now let's just plot the, let's see what this looks like in 3D, just so we have a better idea of what everything looks like. Okay, we can uh, rotate this. And so this is the test values. And then we can look at the prediction. It's one thing that it's a little hard to notice any differences. One thing you do see is the by the boundary condition, uh, by the boundaries, it's not quite as uh, smooth. Um, but yeah, um, looks pretty good. And then we plot, we can subtract the difference to see the error. And we can see a spike 
again, right by that corner. So yeah, so we can, um, it's very easy with this package to plot for really complicated geometries. So yeah, so um, we so if there's are there any questions? Oops, uh, I, I so um, why are there so I see a question in the Slack? Why are there spikes in the loss function curve of the train slash um, testing? What are the sources? Um, so um, yeah, so uh, it's a bit hard to answer. Um, um, basically, it just tries to say new. It could be that the we probably, it probably should be the the learning rate's too high. So when the error is certain uh, is below a certain point, um, just having too high of a low learning rate can kind of kick you out of it. Um, uh, near where near where everything's nice, um, yeah. So it kind of stabilizes around here. But that's where the second order optimizer comes in, where it can um, take something that's pretty good. It can train that, um, it can reduce the error significantly. Hopefully that answers your question. All right, if there's no more questions, I wanna move on to an example where we're having um, even more complicated uh, geometry. And just really show you um, how we can merge different geometries together. So um, while we are waiting for this load, let me explain what we are going to be solving. Um, so we are, we see that we're going to have solve the Laplace equation in um, in a rectangular domain with holes, the cathode and anode. So basically, we're going to have holes at y equals zero, x equals 0 0.5, and x equals minus 0 0.5 with a radius of 0.1. Um, yeah, so while it's loading, um, yeah, so here um, it's just the same thing as before using the Hessians and whatnot, uh, but instead of using the Hessian functions that are built in, um, this example I took from one of the issues in the deep XDE repository. So they decided to use um, to under TensorFlow's built in gradients to do everything as opposed to the Hessian and Jacobian functions. So here, the next thing we need to do is because we've got very complicated boundaries and different stuff going on, we have functions to first identify the boundaries. So this boundary is just um, whether or not it's on the boundary, but then later on, for these other ones, it wants to make sure that for the outer boundary, you're not too close to the middle. Um, for the cathode, you're close to the, the cathode, anode, you're close to the anode. Um, that's all these um, logic statements are here. Then you have the value of the outer, which is zero, the cathode value, which is one, and the anode value, which is negative one. So in, for the deep XDE package, you can combine geometries in various ways. You can have a union, which is the bitwise or, the intersection, which is the bitwise and. So basically union in one or two, intersection that um, region that's in both one and two. And finally, the difference is the one that we're actually going to use in this tutorial, which is exclude geometry two from geometry one. So here, what we do right now is we define, got to run that cell. Um, we define the, um, the rectangle as well as the holes. So we've got the rectangle and you just define the, um, the left corner and the bottom left and the top right corners. And then the disk, you define the origin and the radius. And then we subtract the holes. We subtract the disk from the rectangle to make the holes. And then here we have the boundary conditions that we defined above. So here um, we then make this data object where we have a list of three uh, different boundary conditions here. And we set the number of points, test and training. So, yeah, so then um, this again takes a little while to run, but I just want to show you the um, results. So I just loaded a pre-trained model. And we can see here, so 
Um, the, the blue is the training loss. The other one is the test loss. And um, just one thing to note about the second order optimizer is it only does the, the test loss at the very beginning of the end. So that's why I've got this L shape here. But yeah, you can see um, in, there's a bit good initially after, and then after 25,000 iterations, we get the, the second order optimizer. Now let's look at the predictions. As you see how long this takes, which is very fast. Um, yes, and then you just plot the results. So um, one thing I'm doing here is I'm using a triangulation so we can, doesn't have data in the holes. So yeah, so you can see um, what's near the left side and the right side. We got positive truth by the cathode, negative by the anode. And then if we want to see this in 3D, we can really see what it looks like. And yeah, so this is, um, so we're able to solve this with uh, very complicated boundary conditions. Are there any questions in the chat? Um, Sasha asks, um, could you explain how, a bit how the training and test data were generated and split? Oh, um, so, um, yes, yeah, so when I call the way the training data works in this problem, so I actually don't have of real test data here. So I'm just showing what the model predicts, but the, uh, the, this, the training points are created here. So all it is, is it's randomly sampled over the domain for the num domain, randomly sampled over the boundary and num um, test is, I believe this is randomly sampled over the, um, the domain as well. So yeah, so when you make, um, so that's, and that's what we use to make the predictions um, later on. So basically it's just random and just make the difference is that none of these points were used during the training. And we're just trying to, min and all, um, the thing with pins is you don't actually need to know the solution ahead of time. It will calculate it for the PDE. Um, yeah, um, so the testing is here is more like a, val a validation set. Uh, yes, um, that's essentially what this is. And then I'm just plotting it. Um, I, this is the one case I actually don't have these, the, a real solution for this um, because I took it off the issues page. I never, um, I didn't make that or I didn't have available the test step, the, the actual solution. So this is just the predictions. All right, are there any more questions before moving on to um, my last example with pins? All right, I will be moving on. So this one is going to be this inverse Lorenz system. So the Lorenz inverse system. Um, I should note that for whatever reason, this notebook has been giving me this weird error. Um, it just ignore it. Um, so, um, so yes, yeah, sometimes that will randomly appear um, and just ignore that. So, um, so here we're actually going to solve an inverse problem. So, um, what that is, means is that we want to, um, given some data, we want to be able to find um, to to figure out what a PDE that data obeys. So the Lorenz system here is um, defined as these three coupled ODEs with these coefficients, C1, C2, C3. We can check this link here on the Wikipedia page for more detail. Essentially, it's an, a simple atmospheric model that is known to exhibit chaos. Um, so with um, particularly around the, these parameters, C1 equals 10, C2 equals 28, and C3 equals 8 thirds. Now, um, now, all right, so first we're going to have the plotting and generate data generation function. Um, and just feel free to play around with this one. Um, so one tip I will give you, some tips I will give you for this is that, uh, is that you need to be careful with how much time you give. Um, um, so I have TN equals three. If you do too much time, um, the network will have issues. It's, very, it's better at finding this transient behavior in the beginning. Let me just explain what each of these are. So these Cs are the true value of the parameters in your system. 
x0, y0, z0 are your initial conditions. Uh, this dt is your um, time for integration. And here's the t skip. So basically, you want to you're skipping certain times to simulate um, have the data you'd have available, um, not necessarily what you'd have need for numerical stability, which is what we use for the integration. And yes, yeah, so this is the system here. As you can see, it's um, very few steps are out here, and then it goes here. If you leave this for long enough, you'll get very interesting chaotic phenomenon. All right, so now how do we do define all of this? The first step is um, these defining C as a variable, these C, um, C1, C2, C3. Because we're using the TensorFlow backend, we just declare these as TensorFlow variables is to do something else in PyTorch. And then we define our system. Just like before, we use these uh, Jacobians to define the system. But because we've got multiple outputs, um, we need to use this Y specified which output we are using. And, um, and then we just add in these Cs as, as our coefficients. And um, so that in theory, it will return three zeros if, if the P is obeyed. Boundary is very simple here, um, which is that um, just um, make sure that at the, so the initial condition obeys the correct initial value. Um, and then, but the, there's an interesting one here, which is this point set here, which means that we want to make sure that we have include all of the observations during the training. And yeah, this is the same thing we've done before. So here, again, um, ge GD geometry, the, rent, the PDE, the REN system, the initial conditions and boundary conditions, as well as our observations. And then we set the number in our domain, number of boundary, and we also want to anchor to our time observed observe times. All right, and then we set our model. Yes, so then um, set that to, all right, anyway. So I'm going to load the model. This takes about three minutes to train. So feel free to train it yourself. Um, I will um, not include the, the training, so you have to sit here watching it. But essentially, what you notice, what you'll notice, is that um, it doesn't do very well into about twenty five thousand iterations, and then um, it, it really does solve it. And if you plot the results, you can see that. Um, it doesn't really do well until about 20,000 iterations where it really gets these um, coefficients down. And we just plot and we just see the predictions line up very well with um, the true values. Yeah, so feel free to play around with this one um, for various coefficients. And let me know if you've got any questions. And then I will want to now speak about uh, neural operators. I don't seem to see any questions in the chat. So I will move on um, and talk about um, neural operators. Um, so, so operator networks are, when we want to learn the output field, there's some given input field. So these networks can learn variable initial conditions, boundary conditions, and or source terms. In order to do this, we need to generate data for many different sorts of input fields. And we can use physics information to improve the performance of these networks. <clears throat> so some examples include deep ONET, um, uh, physics informed deep ONET, which I'm gonna use for the tutorial, graph operator nets, Fourier operator nets, and physics informed neural operators with PNOS. <clears throat> so you can see here, it's making predictions for different for <clears throat> for initial conditions for different initial conditions, and um, we ought to evolve it in time for these complicated equations like the Navier-Stokes. So let's talk about the physics informed deep O-nets that we'll be using for our example. So deep O-nets 
can, can gener are very good at generalizing PDE solutions. They take some input fields U, initial conditions, source terms, and or boundary conditions. They have an input coordinate Y, which, is, which can represent space and or time, as well as um, their operator G of U of Y, which is our PDE solution. Um, and they use the difference between the data S and the operator G as our loss. And we can also add physics to these networks to further improve the performance while using less data by incorporating the, the PDE, initial conditions, and boundary conditions. Now, how do we train these networks? Well, we first need to generate these input fields U using Gaussian random fields or GRF. Um, we can use various kernels, such as the RBF or return kernel, to obtain spatially correlated data. And we can associate a length scale associated with typical deviations, typical spatial deviations in the, in the desire in the input field. Moreover, if we want to include certain boundary conditions, we can expand in terms of the Fourier components. And you can see here, this is a return kernel um, obeying to deer play boundary conditions. So for each of these U fields, we um, want to generate um, train, um, we generate the data and we run a simulation using that input. And when we train, we sample the whole solution space. Now, just some examples of some PDEs we looked at. The 1D diffusion reaction equation, which we'll be using in our example, where U is our source term with the uh, homogeneous deer plate boundary conditions. We also have the viscous Burr's equation we saw in a previous example, where U is our initial condition, and the 1D wave equation, where um, U is our initial condition as well, again, periodic boundary conditions. So then if we look at the um, diffusion reaction equation, so this is results on test data, the, the equation is up here. So we first have on the left have our source term U, and then we have these plots showing the exact solution S, and our predicted solution, as well as the absolute error. And then same thing for another source term. And you can see here, we can um, very small compared to the value of the data. Similarly, we have the viscous Burgers equation, same one as we looked at before. Um, and yeah, you can see um, exact, predicted, and the absolute error for these random initial conditions. Finally, we've got the wave equation where we have um, where we have uh, these two initial conditions, and we see, and we have the exact solution, predicted solution, and the absolute error. One thing I like particular about these, the wave equation, is that you can see how the error clearly satisfies the wave equation as it propagates in space and time. So, all right, so I want to just show you um, this physics-informed deep O net for the fusion reaction <clears throat> equation. So, this one, uh, this tutorial. Um, Unlike the others where I kind of walked you through everything, um, this is gonna be more of an overview, just showing how these things work in a more general sense, um, as opposed to going into the specific details of every line. So let me know if you guys have any questions. Um, yes, yeah, so, um, all right, so, um, so the first thing I should note is that this notebook is written in uh, JAX, which is um, essentially it's NumPy on steroids. Um, it, so in JAX, it, it can map um, various NumPy functions to GPU and TPU devices with only slight differences. Um, um, it also provides automatic differentiation and so, I should note that working with low-level environments um, with uh, low-level libraries like JAX are often very nice for physics informed deep learning where we are encoding our own loss functions. Um, and you can look at um, the GitHub here for more details. So here we define just the network layers. Again, it's very low level. Let's find the network as well as a data loader. So the data loader is just PyTorch's data loader. I won't go into too much detail, but essentially um, it just feeds in the data to the network. So then we define the models. This is actually a 
kind of complicated class where it includes training, information, saving, and restoring the model. So I'm not going to look at it too in depth, but um, yeah, just just know that um, that's the model. So for the for the utilities, uh, the main thing is the um, this kernel, so we can generate random uh, spatially correlated data. And here's our diffusion reaction equation right here. So then we need to implement that equation. So what I do is I subclass the model and I add in this PDE and it uses um, JAX's nice um, gradient functions to compute derivatives. And, um, and we also include the initial and boundary conditions, which here is just, um, should just be zeros. And then we have the data generation, where this part solves the equation. I won't go into detail. Then we have um, just making sure that data is formatted correctly for the network. Um, it's quite long, but it's essentially that's all it is. All right, so then we define the data set. So first, uh, just this key thing here, Jax likes a um, special way of doing random numbers. So, um, and it does it consistently. So. Just that's all what this is, that's defined the length scale. Points in X, points in time. So number of samples, we trained on 5,000 samples here as well. And then we just select how many output points from each sample um, for the data, the PDE, the boundary conditions, and the initial condition. Then we wanna show you what it looks like to test for a single sample. So here is a quick plot of what it looks like. There we are. So this is the valid diffusing reaction equation for a random um, source term. And here we go. Then um, now let's generate all the data. So one thing about JAX is it's got this very nice VMAP function where it can do lots of different things in parallel. It's already, and it's already done. I mean, 5,000 us run to the equation. Now we define the layers, um, the branch, the trunk layers, as well as, um, and combine them together. This is just the number of input points, and this is the number of coordinates. And this, the one thing knows that these last layers must be the same because it's a dot product involved. And then we just um, define the network. Now this network takes like a half an hour to train. So um, um, I'm just gonna restore an old model, and then we're just gonna, generate the, uh, regenerate the data. So, um, yeah, so um, look at the training. I originally tried 100,000 iterations. Um, if you want to try it yourself, I recommend 35,000. Uh, I had to stop because my session was about to die. So anyway, so now, so if we compute the, um, the error, you see it uh, looks pretty small. And then if you look at the loss functions, you can see the diff how the different losses decay over time. As you can see, um, the network's still not done. It still does pretty well. And then looking at a single sample, and we're making the predictions, just looking at how the, the data and the network evolve, you can see it matches pretty close to exactly. And then, um, Finally, you can see the um, exact uh, predictions as well as the absolute error. Again, as we saw in the previous plots. And finally, um, wanna just run these yourself. You can make it for um, this plot function. We'll plot the results for, here it's five different examples, but uh, feel free to play around with it and see what you can get. Again, source term, exact prediction, and the absolute error. Yeah, so again, this was um, um, yeah, so this is uh, pretty much all I've got. So um, now I'll turn it over to you guys for questions. Um, so the first I see is does deep onet support time dependent boundary conditions? Um, yeah, so this is again, this is all I code up myself. This should be pretty works pretty well. In theory, yes. Um, you just need to, when you call 
the boundary condition. Um, it's actually it's higher up. So um, you actually have, the thing is you gotta code it yourself though. Um, so basically, um, yeah, so one way to do it is just say, all right. Um, so when um, so when you get this boundary operator, you just have um, so, what, so the way it works here is that um, is that you predict with, with, uh, your coordinates, but um, if you make this. If you have, instead of making this just return a solution, you have it um, return a special time dependent value, you can do that. Um, it, um, but essentially the answer is yes, it can, but you've got you've to implement it yourself. Uh, this is not like deep XD, which is a nice package, which is everything for you. This is much lower level where you've got to, if you want results, you got to put in the work. Any other questions? Uh, yes, Jifu uh, Tan. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you just hey, fine. Hey. Hey, Sean, and thank you very much for the tutorial. I think I understand uh, that a pin pretty well, but somehow that uh, um, deep O nets, it's kind of confusing to me. Could you like explain a little bit more like what exactly deep O nets? So, yeah, so let me take you back to this slide um, here. So the way these, so what deep O nets are is basically you both described this design here of having a branch net and a truck net, where um, the branch net is your coordinates, your truck net is your uh, sense, supposed to represent sensors, and you can merge them together um, into um, and compute an operator with your certain input field at your particular coordinate. Now, I should also note that um, it's not this is not the only sort of operator network. Um, so deep onet was the first one I came across. Um, later ones, um, these Fourier operators and Pinos are also, I think, actually have better performance. Um, Pinos is essentially a Fourier operator network that includes physical information. So I recommend checking more of these out as well. But essentially, deep onets describe this design concept here. Um, and then and just for computing various the results of various operators. Does that answer your question? Yes, but again, um, deep o including this deep O nets where it's not meant to be an all common tutorial, just basically I wanna show you um, a base, something more advanced that you can do with this physics informed deep learning beyond just um, these uh, nice packages that, um, that have, in my opinion, severe limitations, but are useful for some things. Anything, anyone else? If I don't see any more questions, I think I, I've done everything. I'm done with everything. That's good. Thank you, Sean. And we'll be around um, in Slack, and the um, special reservation goes for 15 more minutes if you want to take advantage of the access to GPUs.